viewers, welcome to MedLife School. And today, please welcome Dr. Harvey Kestro, a visionary physician, entrepreneur, and thought leader in the integration of AI and healthcare. With a career spanning over two decades, Dr. Kestro has been at the vanguard of healthcare innovation from leading a healthcare system as CEO to now steering the AI revolution as strategic advisor for ChatGPT and healthcare organizations. His journey from the streets of New York City, where he was raised by a determined single teenage mother to the forefront of medical technology is a testament to the power of resilience, ambition, and the relentless pursuit of excellence. Dr. Kestro, it's an honor to have you with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's a true honor to be here and just to spend a time with you and just talk about, you know, all these uh, things that are going on. To start with, I mean, your journey is becoming a pioneer in the integration of healthcare and artificial intelligence is both inspiring and filled with unique experiences. Our audience is eager to delve into the stories behind your achievements, those that highlight the depth and diversity of your path. So could you share with us three lesser known facets of your journey that have profoundly impacted your perspective and approach in healthcare innovation? So I'm going to start way back. Um, I grew up in New York City. And as you mentioned, my teenage mother raised me. And my first experience as uh, in healthcare was, was not a good one. I have this scar in my left hand. You really can't see it, but it goes from here to here. And it's just a reminder of what had happened to me when I was about 12 years old, the typical teenager at that time, I, I wanted to be like Michael Jordan. Every time I would see a, a sign, um, a parking sign or anything in the street of New York, I would always just jump up and hit it. And this, that would be my way of just practicing and being a kid. Well, one time, unfortunately, when I went up to hit it, there was a piece of metal that I didn't see. And then it stuck me and then it kind of cut my hand open. And so... I went to the emergency room and I, I remember waiting about uh, eight hours. And then when I was there, um, the doctor was like, this is, you know, I didn't know any better, but he says, this, this took too long. So we're going to have to uh, just go raw and no, you don't get any anesthetic. And I felt every suture. And after that, I thought, I don't want to be, uh, I want to be a doctor, but I want to be that compassionate doctor. And I want to be that person that just, loves on his patients and re, you know no matter what of their status uh you now it came from an indigent uh population i i wanted to be treated the same as everybody else so i gave myself that as one of my points second time in my career um growing up um early on probably four years later i was working in a health food store and I just remember going through and just being fascinated with the alternate medicine side of life, uh, vitamins, supplements, herbs, uh, different, uh, you know, things that people would come in and say, oh, this works for this or that. And so I really took it to heart uh, to the point where I memorized every pill that was in the uh, health food store. And my favorite part was I would get the elderly coming in. And they would say, I would get to um, put herbs in different bags and I would get to weigh. So if they only wanted like two, three ounces, ounces of chamomile or valerian root or something, I would get to see. But then the best part is I would ask them, I'm like, why are you buying this? What is it? Can you teach me? And so every customer was actually teaching me. And so that really inspired me because later in my career, I just valued looking at the whole, not just traditional medicine, but looking at alternative medicine and then opening my mind to look at businesses and and other sciences out there to really look at the whole and then it'll come into play in a little bit and then the last part of my life which was really blessing I got to start a company um, basically I was working in the emergency room uh, I, I call it being called into the office a lot the uh, administrator of the hospital is like hey you're ordering too many cat scans you're on average as far as seeing patients but uh, some of your colleagues are seeing patients way faster and we want you to be able to see faster, more patients and, and get more numbers. And I just remember thinking, I, I work so hard to be a doctor. I, I love what I do. And you're asking me not to be a doctor in a way. You, you want me to hurry up. You want me to not order things. In my opinion, some of my patients that were coming through the ER would never see a doctor again. And so in my opinion, I was like, this is their one shot to get everything done and I'm going to do it for them. And I know I, the administration would get upset at me but fast forward, um, that gave me the spark to start my own company. And I basically started eight emergency rooms 
grew it to about 350 employees. Um, and I taught my doctors the opposite. I said, the more time you spend with patients, the more uh, you'll go up the ranks in, my, in the company. The more uh, you love on your patients and really spend time and, and focus on the whole, you'll do better here. And so it was kind of fun in that I got to start my own in my, my my own mind, my own healthcare system. I got to teach and practice medicine the way I thought it should be practiced. And I got to go back to the basics, you know, like that first story. I, I, I suffered my first time, but now I was able to just create my own pseudo company. Uh, I had my own staffing company, my own billing company, uh, my own marketing company. And I got to control the people that were working there. And I know that sounds kind of harsh to say, but I got to put people that really wanted to love on their patients, that really wanted to spend extra time. And that grew so fast that people just wanted to come to us. In fact, we were having people driving a couple of hours just to come to our emergency room just because they loved our service. So inspiring. And, you know, I think it's from the very early in your life, the compassion was a part of, of it. Like, you know, as, as the story about working at the store, you just don't feel very mechanical, but you had the compassion and learning. So I think these two things always are very common, I think, in most of the leaders and innovators. They are the learners from the very beginning. They learn, they want to know. And uh, rightly said about our system, sometimes as a healthcare provider, we do get uh, tied up with the complexity of a healthcare system. We want to provide the care that we feel, right, as a healthcare provider. But then there's a lot of other elements, the administration, the system, and, you know, the payers. And, like, there's so much complexity that we sometimes feel like we are not justifying to our patients. And it's really remarkable to hear that you took that problem and then you created a solution for that by creating those emergency rooms. So on, on the same note, we would like to you know, ask you if you can share your early experiences that reveal the healthcare gaps. I, you mentioned two of them, uh, but if there are any more any uh, healthcare gaps that you experienced in the initial days that sparked your innovative spirit and how has your two decades in the journey as a physician led to see or embrace artificial intelligence in healthcare? I'm going to go back to the first iPhone ever. Uh, I had recently graduated from residency and I was in the emergency room coding a patient. And I'll never forget telling the nurse, hey, we need to start this uh, drip. And uh, the nurse was like one minute and she went to get a textbook out, started thumbing through it and said, okay, I'm verifying your dose. This looks right. Okay, I'm going to start. And I remember looking at her thinking, this is taking too long. You know, even if it took a minute, that's a minute too long. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to teach myself how to program. And I created the first uh, ID meds uh, application on the iPhone in the world. And it actually went viral. And my point of the story is I just saw a, a point that people were suffering, people needed information quickly, and to the health of a patient, especially in the emergency room, when seconds count, I wanted to do whatever we could to make that workflow possible to make it quicker, efficient, and safe. And so that was my small way of contributing to it. And it was really fun because I got to, I got addicted to it. I, I ended up creating about 30 different apps as a doctor and really finding solutions. You know, back then we were really big on the stroke scale. So I made my own stroke scale and uh, ways to memorize and, and different, different applications like that. And so it was just fun for me to find a problem in healthcare, but be so compassionate and passionate about how to fix it. And then just jumping in and saying, I have the the medical part. Now the IT, I'm not the greatest, but I have enough, you know, after you've done 30 apps, after a while, you kind of get the flow of how these apps are going. And then fast forward, um, Dallas, Texas said, hey, we want to create this thing for uh, wait times in Dallas. Can you help us? And so I helped them create the wait time app. And it was really cool because now a consumer could just open up an app and know how long the waits were in the different parts of DFW. And if they lived in part A or B, they could say, okay, I'm going to go here or there. Or they at least knew how long the wait was. So it was kind of fun to, again, find a, a position point of something that was a pain point, but then to be able to use your MD, your degrees, your experience, your clinical gestalt and say, you know what, this is probably the best way to attack this problem. And then I, I give that long story because it really leads into AI. So November 2022, 
I am playing with ChatGPT and I, I'm looking at it. I, I lucked out because it was the first day it came out and I thought, oh my God, this is going to change medicine. And I had that aha moment, like when I was wrote the first IV meds app on the iPhone, I thought this is like the iPhone, but better. And so I know my wife thought I was crazy. I was in this office. I was dedicated. I, I was on a sabbatical. So I, all I did was type and I typed for about three weeks and I wrote my first book called ChatGPT and Healthcare. But it was, again, not supposed to <clears throat> make any money. It wasn't supposed to make me famous or anything. The goal was, let me teach doctors, pro healthcare professionals. Let me teach um, patients how to use ChatGPT, how to think outside the box. How can we use this technology? And so when the book came out, nobody knew what ChatGPT was. I would tell my colleagues, my friends, I would get a haircut. Any place I went, I would always ask people and they, were, they had no idea, but but in my mind, I told my wife, look, if it sells one copy, then mission accomplished, because that's one person that's going to look at it and say, huh, that's some different way of practicing medicine. And to me, it's that doctor in our hearts. We, we want to help others. And so if we can help people, I thought, you know, I could help one person. But if I can uh, write a book and if I can go out there and teach, then that's going to multiply and that's going to really grow. And this is going to just spread. And so it's been such an honor. Uh, last year, I, I was a keynote speaker literally around the world, um, traveled all over the U.S., and just been able to talk about how to use AI in healthcare. And it's just been such a blessing. You, you are a very rare combination. You know that in medicine. And it's an important combination that we need. You're a, Obviously, you're a healthcare provider by heart. You're a doctor by heart. But you also have a brain and and I think the passion to learn the technology. And that's very important. Sometimes we want to serve our patients, but we ignore integrating technology to make it efficient, augment our services. And I think I always feel like that we as doctors should join hands with technology. We, I mean, obviously, you are a little next level because you could code and create yourself. But if you don't go to that level also, at least understand it. And embrace it, right? Be part of it. Don't be scared because we sometimes get a little bit intimidated when it's too technical in healthcare. But no, let's try to embrace it, understand it, and join hands because technology alone or an engineer alone cannot build an efficient solution for the healthcare because they have no understanding how the relationship in the real world patient-doctor relationship goes and stuff. But as a doctor, you know, we, we live into that. And if we join hands, I think the solutions are more efficient. We see you as a learner. We see you as a preacher because when you learn something, you just didn't keep it to yourself. You want the world to, to learn it. We touch about ChatGPT and we know you're a very big into AI. And when it comes to any advanced versions of AI, you know, ChatGPT. Now, the integration of these, you know, ChatGPT, large, large language models, LLMs like ChatGPT into healthcare. Uh, you are at the cutting edge of medical innovation. Can you share how you see these technologies transforming patient care and hospital operations? And what are some of the most exciting developments you are working on, uh, you know, with your team? So I got this propped out. Uh, these are meta glasses. Uh, they're transition lens. So if I go outside, there are sunglasses. They're not a prescription. Um, but what's really cool is I can talk to Meta and I can say, hey, Meta, take a picture. It takes a picture. It takes a video. Um, if I need information, I can ask Meta to give me information or I can pair this to my phone and talk to ChatGPT. Now, the cool part is as you're asking me questions, I could in theory repeat the question, it would hear it. And then in my ear, it would tell me the answer. And then I would give it to you. And it'd be the glasses helping me. Now, the reason I'm showing you is that the latest edition, I'm, uh, I got early access for developer reasons that I can develop things for this. And one of the things that it does now is I can take a picture and say, I'm looking at my phone and it'll take a picture of my phone and say, what is this? And how much does this thing cost? And so now it's actually analyzing pictures. And so the reason I'm sharing this as an example is could you imagine having this in the emergency room since I'm an ER doc I'll give that example where um, if I'm consulting again there's HIPAA compliance and there's all these things but just work with me for a second assume that I take care of the HIPAA and all that and imagine you're my patient and say you your favorite doctor is Dr. X and no matter what that Dr. X says you want that doctor to be in the loop and I'm your ER doctor now with the glasses I can turn on the video call your doctor 
doctor can examine you through my eyes. I can do my physical exam. They can see you in lifetime. Um, if there's questions, uh, the other portion to this is I can have information relayed to my ear. So you may not realize, but then I can do a consult. So there's just all these fascinations of how this can work. And so the reason I share that particular example is because at the end of the day, it's about understanding that technology and then taking it to the next level. How can I use it? How can I use this device to help patients? And so by being able to use our core as a physician and, uh, and I'm an entrepreneur, and I understand the basics of AI, when I put those three worlds together, I'm able to create things that other people say, wow, I would have never thought of that one. But it's not because I'm smart or anything like that. I'm not. I just think it's just looking at it subjectively. I literally take off my doctor hat and I look at it from an entrepreneur's point or an or administrator of a hospital. What would they object? What would they not like? What would they would like? And then I put on my doctor hat. I'll like, okay, healthcare professionals. Because here's the thing. We can invent the best thing in the world, but if the healthcare professionals never want to use it, it'll never be done. And so it's a combination of bringing in the, the healthcare professions with the innovators and then using this technology that's AI is just so amazing. And so to answer your question now, um, I'm really passionate about communication. And I know that sounds weird. But as a doctor, there's just so many times that either A, again, I'm an ER doctor, working at a at a hospital or location near the airport, I would get people from all over the world. And so imagine a world where I could use these glasses to help me translate with the patient or be able to communicate. If I give, I'm, from, I'm in Dallas, Texas. So if uh, let's just pretend you're in New York City. If I give you Texas examples, you'll be like, I don't know what he's saying, or I kind of get it, but I don't. But if I use New York examples and culture and colloquialism and uh, down to your sex and ethics and those uh, things, then now when I speak to you, you're like, wow, Dr. Castro really speaks to me. He speaks to my 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 persona, who I am, and not that I'm making assumptions, but you could use AI. And so again, to communication, to give you the example, what we're working on is the following. Um, my team and I are working on create uh, my, uh, 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 basically a discharge summary in that we're able to take core concepts. Let me give you an example. Let's pretend we have a pediatric asthma child and the child is uh, first time diagnosed with asthma. There's a lot of things that you have to teach, how to use the inhaler, how to use the nebulizer, uh, signs and symptoms, exercise induced asthma. I mean, there's a long list of things that you have to teach that poor child. And you know very well that we what we do is we print out these long discharge papers and we give them to the parents and then we're like, next, because the average person only spends 13 minutes with their doctor. But what if I took those same discharge instructions, fed them into ChatGPT, and then ChatGPT talked to them as a five-year-old, used the words of a five-year-old, but then I take those core concepts and I feed that into uh, AI again to make a coloring book. And instead of giving them text, I'm actually giving the child a coloring book. And imagine the child now can look at the concept and understand why they need their medicine, why they needed to tell an adult that they're having an asthma attack and illustration and color. Now, in theory, the doctor can color with the patient. The nurse could do it. The parents can. And now that child gets that un understanding of that medical disease to another level. All of that translates into communication. And so my goal is to use this tool today to help us communicate different languages, different cultures, different ways of understanding. You might be a visual learner. I may be an auditory uh, learner. Why not create AI that I can type and create a video and now you see it? Or if I listen, then why not create those same into an audio file? And so when I discharge, I can go home, I can drive uh, and listen to my discharge instructions with my doctor's voice. I mean, now these are the things that we can start doing today to help our patients. I'm amazed I was listening. You're bringing together, not making the it personalized, but you're also making the healthcare less scary. You know, nobody enjoys it. Like when we go for to a, a restaurant, we go with a different uh, emotions. People don't come to the healthcare with that emotion because, you know, you will be leaving with a lot of instructions, which by the time you reach home will be filtered to 50% or even 10% remaining. It's a lot. But what you're doing is you're bringing the communication to a different level. You're making it engaging, but entertaining. 
at the same time, especially to the younger patients, right? I mean, as a caregiver also for younger patients, it's too much to do, to teach them, to observe them. We, I have kids and I know the pain of it. So if you're involving these young patients in their own journey, understanding their own healthcare with this you know, beautiful like uh, project that you're doing with this coloring. I mean, it's amazing. And, you know, not the visual, but the auditory part also. How far are you in this project? Is it already launched or where are we in this project? Uh, we're working out the different multimodalities. So doing the audio, uh, now that OpenAI just uh, announced a, a video that's about a minute, we're anxious to see where that is in about six months to a year. Um, we're working on the translation where we already have the main tools and the different uh, types of uh, large language models. Again, there's not just ChatGPT, there's Llama, there's uh, Google Gemini. So we're working with the different ones and just testing out to see which one's better. And then obviously for our hospitals and administrations, some of these things that we want to do, they may not be ready for this. So as we're moving forward, it helps to have a physician involved. It helps to have a professional that's had 20 years experience to say, hey, this would be something that would be amazing. And so it's been a lot of fun working side by side with the programmers and with the team because I get to, I understand enough AI principles and, and stuff that we can sit down and talk about the theory and the limitations. But then the nice thing about not being a data scientist is that I look at it with child eyes. And so I may say, why can't we do this? And they're like, oh, it's never been done. I'm like, but is there something holding us back? And they're like, actually, no. And so I tend to break the rules in the sense that I, I don't go in a straight line. Sometimes I go in a zigzag line to get to the same end. But at the end of the goal for all of us in healthcare is just whatever's best for our patient. And they say that, you know, when you're not the expert from that particular um, area, you have an out-of-box thinking. Literally what you said to you when you sit with your data scientists and developers, and they have a very specialized, uh, you know, understanding of this. So that limits the uh, also the the imagination, right? But as a person from outside, you come and it's like, okay, but this is the problem. This is how the beautiful solution can be built. So not done before. And that's why we will be doing now. So let's find the ways. Now you have navigated the complex journey of integrating this cutting edge technologies like AI and data scientists, very foreign words to a lot of healthcare professionals into healthcare. Now, what have been some of the most formidable challenges you have encountered? And moreover, how do you envision your work bridging the gap between traditional healthcare practices and the digital future? Oh, great question. You know, it's been tough because honestly, from on so many levels, you know, people are scared of the unknown. So number one, AI is literally a black box. We don't know how it's getting it. I mean, we, yeah, there's uh, mathematical equations and it's guessing the next word, but it's not really thinking. But then when you start talking to administrators, you know, is this something that needs to be approved by the FDA? Is this something that uh, will it be um, transferred into the workforce where uh, the workflow will be different? And so one of the biggest obstacles right now is just the understanding of how this works. You know, I've had administrators tell me, hey, uh, if this comes into my hospital, I'm quitting. Like, I don't want this in my hospital. And we've had other people like, no, we, we want this like yesterday. And so my answer to that particular obstacle is we just need to educate. I joke and say, this could be the same applying to your spouse. If you fight with your spouse, it's just a lack of education on both sides. If you educate each other and say, hey, this is how I see it, but this is how you see it. And this is my train of thought and, and understand my point of view. You're a lot more likely to find a resolution or not to fight as much because you, you get the other person. And I, the same thing applies in medicine. When we're talking to a CEO or, or a doctor that uh, does not like AI, then it's the important time to let's just educate. Let's sit down and talk about the good, the bad, the unknown. What what's going on with AI? Explain, make it explainable. Let's take that black box and make it into something like more of like a knowledge graph that they can see. Okay, this is how it's getting that information. But the more the uh, professionals understand how it works, the more likely they're going to adapt. So my first step always is just to see where they're at. Instead of looking at their healthcare IQ, I'm looking at their AI IQ, where they're at, what do they understand, um, can they implement. And what's really fascinating to me is also depending on the geographic area. 
you know, obviously, if it's a hospital in Silicon Valley, more than likely, those hospital administrators have friends in Silicon Valley that doctors that are using the technology, it's a lot easier to sell it to them. But if I'm in Texas, and we go to East Texas, and they are very traditional, and there's a certain way of doing things, and I go against the current, it may not go well for me. So then I have to go in very carefully. And so instead of uh, doing a huge uh, data shift in the way they see things, I may have to do small things like, hey, let's get rid of your facts. <laughs> hey, <laughs> let's uh, do uh, transcription. Instead of me uh, looking down and typing all day long, why not convert the hospital into now a lot of workflows can just be this conversation and it's going to the EMR. So those kind of things are a little bit more gentler and easier to uh, integrate than something stronger like that. Yeah, and I think I like that how you approach it, that it has to be done that way that you approaches the the system at the different levels because as you said some doctors or systems have an understanding based on you know where they are if this buzzword has been around them quite a lot which is you know if you're silicon valley in fact even if you're in california la you you have you know most of the hospitals are in kind of a forefront when it comes to innovations technology ai and adopting it but similarly it might be but it might be a very different story when you're going to Arizona or, or, you know, areas like that where you have to start with, okay, what do you know so far or what you have been doing so far to digitize your workforce and, uh, you know, and and take it from there. So now we'll take a little, little playful detour. And I would like to ask if you could journey back in time to meet any innovator or a healthcare, healthcare pioneer, who would it be and why? And what's one burning question you would ask him or her to get insights that could inform your work in integration AI and healthcare today? Oh, let me think about that one. That one's good. That's a good, fun question. So if I had to pick someone, I've always been fascinated personally with Leonardo da Vinci. I just think an inventor, a scholar, someone that just loves school, that just kept learning. That's that's my mission in life. So to me, looking at him, he obviously the anatomy books, uh, looking at his classical artworks and then engineering and the art, I would love to ask him, you know, basically what what drove your curious curiosity to do all these innovations? And um, how did you apply this interdisciplinary uh, approach when it comes to solving healthcare? Because I would love to get into his brain if he was able to invent all these things and give him the problem today of how it is. It'd be amazing to just see. I, I firmly believe I love talking to children and I love talking to people that are not in healthcare because they will tell you how it is. They will see it a certain way and the objectivity is different. When you talk to a, someone that's a physician like myself that's been maybe biased by healthcare, then I'm bringing in a bias myself into the solution. But if I speak to a non-healthcare provider, or professional, and we go through it together, it's just fascinating to see their mindset. So that that would be my my number one person that I'd love to talk to. Now let's, from the past, let's take you to the, to the kind of, again, a little imaginary, but um, the future. So let's say looking ahead, what's your ultimate dream for the fusion of technology and healthcare? And how do you, you see your work evolving? So let's say if you could invent a healthcare technology with one superpower, what would it be and why? You know, I thought about this in general. Um, I really think it's about combining all the disciplines. Where, uh, the, the, for example, we have wearables where people are knowing their blue, blood, blood, blood glucose. Um, your iPhone gives you all this information, maybe HRV, your heart rate, whatnot. And so my ultimate dream would be to bring all these informations all into one and then create the best predictive analytic tool. Uh, powered by AI and all these things. For example, I personally believe this is going to happen because I'll give you an example to really drive this point. If I grabbed a cigar right now and started smoking during this interview, you would think, what the hell is Dr. Castro doing? He's smoking. That's not good for him. He's chain smoking. You would be like, why? But now we all know smoking is bad for you. Fast forward, AI is going to teach us how to take care of ourselves. It's going to alert us before disease happens. It's going to tell us, hey, you not sleeping this amount of time, you're going to shorten your lifespan. We know a lot of these things, but imagine AI being able to speak to us on a daily basis. There's this thing by Whiting's that should be coming out any day now. I say any day now, but sometime this year. 
And it's this thing that you can urinate and it gives you over 5,000 metabolites of you and tells you this is what's going on. And so imagine a world of predictive analytics where I'm getting all this data and I'm getting this smart device telling me, hey, don't do this, sleep here, uh, don't buy that food, buy this food, eat more of this, do less of that. Fast forward, what's going to happen? I really think we're going to start living longer. Our technology, if the average age of a, of a, a man or I'll say a woman is 85, I do see the future where the average age may be 100, 110. That would be the average because we're going to start doing preventative care. We're going to start catching things before we let that disease process get to the next level. And we're going to start using this technology to maybe we're using genetics. We're splicing your, your genome and inserting certain DNA into it. We're using personalized approach where instead of me taking this pill that is the same pill for the whole population, maybe it's customized to my genetics, my <laughs> place of origin, and it's giving me maybe a lesser dose. Now it's the right amount of medicine for me. The next part um, is what if I could just print my own medicine? Instead of going to the pharmacy, telemedicine, you pop up and you're my doctor and you're like, hey, doctor, uh, based on your analytics, you're going to need this. And then one second and then it's printing. And then boom, I'm able to take it immediately. How fast am I able to jump on the disease? So I really think this will be the future. The last one is definitely, I think, a futuristic. But again, as you said, something that we were foreseeing to be happening in, in 50 years happened quite fast in 10 years and a decade and it could be it will be much much faster these innovation coming and one thing i hear very common from the healthcare providers you know people think sometimes they think the healthcare system and the providers are all here for the taking care of a sick patient they want you to get sick they don't want but it's like you come to us only when you are sick but as a healthcare providers, we believe in the preventing that disease. You use the word preventative care, predicting it before it happens, giving you a roadmap of, to avoid it, preventing it. And if it still happens, then obviously you have tools to take care of it. But preventative care, I think, has been a, quite a, a model which a lot of healthcare providers, you know, predictive and preventative care. Our healthcare system is not just the sick care. It is, it is beyond that. Now, you know, again, we can talk a lot because there's a lot to learn from you, uh, especially this combination. As I said, you are a very rare combination of a person who's expert with the two decades of expertise in healthcare. And now uh, this, this advanced technology, not just AI, you go to a level to chat GPT, all these advancements and with your glass thing, you know, uh, fascinating. How as a healthcare person, you're so advanced in not only knowing, but literally first hand doing this, this uh, you know, technology integration. So as we wrap Dr. Castro, um, you know, your, this discussion has been really enlightening. Would like to ask, could you share some insights with, with our listeners, with our diverse listeners from around the world, from building visionaries to experienced skeptics that we have listening here? On the vital role of innovation in healthcare, what would you say that? And what guidance would you offer to those eager to make their mark in this field, ensuring they navigate its complexities effectively and contribute meaningfully to a healthier future? What would be your advice? My advice is kind of like riding a bike. The more you ride it, the better you get at it. Eventually, you don't even need to hold a bike. You can just ride the bike without your hands. And so with that same analogy, we need to learn AI. We need to um, spend time keeping up with it. Um, I would suggest, number one, follow a, an influencer, someone that's on it. Uh, I'm biased, and I'm going to say you should follow me on LinkedIn or social media because I, I literally post about this stuff every single day. And it's important because if you don't want to get into the, the scientific part of it or the data analytics and all that stuff, it may be too boring. Then just understanding that it exists because then if you know that it exists – then you can see it coming. But then here's the best part. The more you understand just the basics of AI and the way the different things work, you're going to look at it with your eyes of your specialty. If you're a cardiologist, you can be like, oh my gosh, what if I did this? Because I understand these principles. I understand this technology. I see the limitations. I know why it won't work. But then you look at it from your point of view. So I'm going to encourage everybody. It's like riding on a bike, get on that bike, 
follow an influencer. Um, I actually created my own AI course because I had so many doctors reaching out saying, hey, can you help me? And I said, you know what, I'm just going to make my own course. And then it's there online where people can just kind of understand it. The second part to this is if you really want to get into it, then it's to really kind of like the, uh, the medical mantra, see one, do one, teach one. So see it yourself. Start teaching your colleagues, your family, people around you. And then after that, what you've done, you've seen it, you've done it. And then uh, see one, do one, teach one. So do that. And then you'll see that the more you do that, you're going to get really good because until you teach it, that's when you know you know it. But if you can't teach it, that means you still need some more work. You need to start brushing up again on some of this stuff. I think the resources that you just named um, are going to be really helpful for people who are just starting in this journey. You know, having a mentor or a guider as, as an influencer is really important because you have done really the hard work in in giving that initial perspective because, you know, everybody has to build their own understanding. But having the resources that are created by the expert, both from the healthcare perspective and, uh, you know, the technology is definitely uh, important to kickstart your understanding. And then obviously, you know, you, you, as you said, you know, you, you follow them, you ask them to have, you know, their time, which could be in the form of, I don't know if you do consultancies and stuff like that, but that is the way to get to learn, you know, especially with this healthcare technology that we are in the world of. And again, influencers like you are rare. Dr. Kester, today's conversation has been a fascinating journey into the hearts of healthcare's AI revolution. Your insights on generative AI and chat GPT have sparked a new wave of enthusiasm for what the future holds. We are very grateful for your pioneering uh, spirit and the innovative paths you're forging. So it's been an honor to have you on our podcast. Your insights have been invaluable and we are very grateful for the opportunity to learn from your expertise. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you so much. Have a blessed day.